Uh, my name is Sam Shireman. I am relatively new to the Applied Social Media Lab, as is pretty much everyone within the Applied Social Media Lab, since we're a brand new department. I came on board at the beginning of May as the, um, the product manager for the deliberations team here. Uh, so I, for quite some time, have been very focused on technology that helps people connect across divides, uh, either by helping people understand different perspectives or helping them communicate effectively. Uh, I am especially interested in solutions that scale. A lot of them do not. Uh, I got involved in this during my work at a company called All Sides uh, for a number of years. I was the director of product there. And All Sides works to bridge divides using media bias ratings and balanced news. Uh, so I learned a lot about echo chambers and how information spreads online, what leads people to believe the things that they believe. My background is also in cognitive science. So I love thinking about thinking and why people think the things that they do. Uh, and in that work, I got involved in a field that we sort of internally call the bridging field. So lots of organizations working to bridge divides in a wide variety of ways. Um, and that brought me into dialogue work and brought me eventually here. How about you? And I'm Larry Lessig, uh, and I've been <clears throat> in the Berkman space for more than 25 years. Um, and it's so wonderful to be back uh, in this project. Um, when I was here in the Berkman space, I was thinking about the relationship between law and technology, and then society and technology. And then our friend Aaron Swartz forced me out of this space to think about the problems of democracy. And I spent the last 18 years uh, focused on the problems of democracy. And that experience convinced me that there, <clears throat> there are a lot of problems and they're really hard. And I'm not sure we're going to solve them. Um, but it helped me identify certain weaknesses that we have to find a way in our culture to solve, certain muscles that we have to find a way to exercise and develop if we're going to get beyond the deeply dysfunctional political culture we have right now into one that can begin to grapple in a democratically uh, productive way with the problems that we care about. Um, of course, that's one slice of the problem. There are so many others, including money and all of that other stuff. But let's just focus on this particular one. And so what inspired me to come back to the Berkman Center and work in this particular project was the idea that we might be able to encourage the spread of a certain practice by enabling an extremely cheap and easy technology that could, that could be embraced across a wide range of contexts. This is not so much about setting up um, a particular service and saying, come here and we will solve democracy. It's about enabling a kind of practice that we can push into many different contexts that's supported by a technology that if, became, if it became the norm in how we do things would strengthen the muscles of democracy. And that's what led us to this project and I was so eager and happy to find Sam who agreed to come and lead it for us. So Larry and I came into each other's circles uh, through our mutual interest in deliberations and in citizens' assemblies. Uh, we, we met, uh, we were in a, an association together called CADA, uh, Citizens' Assembly and Democracy Allies, I believe. And when I heard about uh, the Applied Social Media Lab and the fact that there was going to be a deliberations project here, he announced it. Uh, in that group and I we had a, a conversation and we wanted to make sure that we were we were sort of vision aligned uh, And so I'd say this this vision we started to build it during that conversation and then um, Once I uh, came on board with the applied social media lab We've developed it. So our, our joint vision here what we are trying to solve for so we're trying to build a world where the practice of constructive dialogue is a norm 
where diverse perspectives catalyze innovative solutions rather than deepen societal divides. And I think that very nicely fits in with your idea of democracy being a muscle that we, uh, that we work to build. And today's theme is dumpster fires, right? Discourse dumpster fires. Uh, so what dumpster fires are getting in the way of this vision? What barriers do we have uh, to constructive discourse? So I, I'm supposed to talk about barriers because I'm so negative. Um, and, um, <laughs> Um, so the barriers here are, first of all, it's difficult to build deliberative environments that scale easily. It's difficult to focus people on the particular subject or information they need in order for it to scale efficiently. It's difficult to be perspective inclusive, and by that I mean making sure you have the information necessary to evaluate the ideas that you're supposed to be uh, uh, talking about. It's difficult to keep clarity around those ideas. And these difficulties together um, make it very hard to build, either in real space or in virtual space, environments where productive deliberation can occur. So we bought something. <laughs> Uh, we, um, or Harvard, uh, has purchased a, an existing deliberation platform uh, that Larry and I actually have both used extensively in various events. So this is a pre-existing functional deliberation platform uh, developed by Ben Turtell and Danny Franklin of Lightning Rod Labs, uh, who I've had the pleasure of working very, very closely with um, during this uh, acquisition as well as previously. And this platform s uh, begins to address several of those barriers that we talked about. So we're very excited to have uh, a foundation to really jump off from uh, as we get to work towards making it our own. I'm very excited about bringing this platform into the academic lab structure uh, so that we don't have to worry specifically about developing and, and expanding this platform uh, for a specific client or for a specific grant. We really get a very unique opportunity here within ASML to center the public interest. So we get to take this really cool foundation that we're really excited about and that we, we saw had so much promise when we used it during events previously. Uh, and we get to we get to make it something that's going to be accessible and useful for uh, for as broad a context as as we think is reasonable. Uh, so, um, a few of the ways that it addresses those barriers. Uh, the first barrier we talked about is scale, right? The ideal um, the ideal way if you are going to have an online conversation, uh, or sorry, if you're going to have any sort of conversation where you need it to be constructive, you're talking about a difficult topic, you need to, uh, you want people within your community to connect across divides, or you want them to be able to solve a problem together. Uh, you want them to be able to deliberate, come to some sort of consensus. By the end of any sort of difficult conversation, there is no, um, there's no substitute for an in-person facilitated conversation, right? Unfortunately, that does not scale uh, for the, especially for the organizations that I've worked with within the bridging field. We have a lot of uh, incredibly dedicated, incredibly well-intentioned, small, strapped for cash nonprofits. And um, if they're going to, uh, allow people in their community to have these difficult conversations, they're probably not going to have a trained facilitator in every single breakout room for those conversations. Uh, so what this uh, platform provides is hostless facilitation options. So it allows the groups to actually guide their own experience, move to the next discussion prompt uh, themselves, and that sort of thing. 
Uh, the next barrier is focus. It's very difficult to keep people on task. Uh, I'm sure many of you have had the experience, especially in a large scale of uh, online event. Let's say you're in a, a large Zoom and everyone gets sent to breakout rooms and you get in that breakout room and you meet your, uh, your other participants and you're like, what? were we supposed to talk about again? <laughs> What's happening here? Uh, and so what this platform offers is an, a directly integrated discussion guide. So the, the conversation prompt uh, is embedded directly into the experience. So it's very, very clear um, what, your, what your prompt is and you can let the platform know when you're ready to move on to the next prompt. Uh, the next barrier is perspective inclusiveness. Um, sort of a fancy way of saying it's really hard to make sure that all of the important perspectives are actually discussed in that room. And this can happen for a variety of reasons. One is that if somebody has a really important perspective in a, uh, in a small group conversation, if they think that people are going to disagree with that perspective, they often won't say it at all. Uh, Another problem with that is that often the people who have those really important perspectives aren't in the room in the first place. This is the primary one that, uh, that I spent a lot of time thinking about during my time at All Sides, right? And we were, we were spending a lot of time thinking about echo chambers and the fact that people just often aren't able to even interact with folks who have different perspectives and different backgrounds from them. And so the way that this platform addresses those challenges is through intelligent group matching, which we're going to talk more about later because we're actually going to have a little bit of a demo for that. Uh, but intelligent group matching meaning that you can ask people registration questions when they're actually registering for an online event. And then you can automatically on the fly generate breakout rooms uh, based on differences in how they answered those registration questions. Uh, and then participation nudges. This is a functionality that I definitely want to expand, but there is um, within the, the platform uh, a feature that basically tells you, are you speaking considerably more or considerably less than other people in the room? Uh, if you are taking up too much space, it'll give you a gentle nudge to maybe make some room for others. Uh, and if you haven't spoken at all, it'll encourage you to speak up. Uh, and then the last barrier is clarity. Uh, this especially is in the problem solving context. Uh, if it is a, a deliberative use case you want, uh, typically there's going to be a lot of background information that people need to absorb, they need to think thoughtfully about and uh, come to a thorough understanding of those materials, of all of the context, and then at the end have some sort of deliberal, uh, uh, deliverable <laughs> and, um, or like a policy recommendation at the end of that. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, America Talks, which was, uh, I used this platform, um, the, the platform that we purchased, was previously known as Chasm, um, developed by Lightning Rod, and they, uh, I used this platform for a variety of events, but this was by far the largest. So America Talks was a, a group effort um, with All Sides, um, National Week of Conversation, Listen First Project, Civic Health Project, and many others. It was in partnership with USA Today. And what we did was get um, as many Americans as possible, we ended up getting a couple thousand, uh, to join for an online conversation across divides. So what they would do is they would answer some registration questions. Uh, we certainly asked uh, some questions about their politics. I would say the most salient divide for this conversation was the, the US political left-right divide. But we also asked questions like, did you grow up in a rural or urban area? Uh, what's your age? What's your ethnicity? There are a wide variety of um, of differences that we wanted to connect people across. So they would answer those registration questions. We would send them an email when it was time to join that event. Um, they would watch a, a welcome video that we put together. Uh, the welcome video, I will say, 
was an important aspect <laughs> of it. It doesn't necessarily have to be a welcome video, but anyone who's run events knows the importance of setting the tone. Uh, so people show up awfully nervous to talk to someone from the other side, you know. Uh, so <laughs> walking them through those conversation norms as Lara and Charlie did and setting that tone. And then they would be sent to breakout rooms, matched across differences, and have a conversation. Uh, so here we have an example of that registration form, some of the questions that they actually answered that they were matched across. And then, of course, the, the hostless facilitation, uh, which was absolutely critical if we're going to have a couple thousand people showing up for one event. Uh, and then this is not quite uh, the current form of the platform, but this you can see uh, one of the iterations of it with that integrated discussion guide. So that prompt sort of first and front, front and center there, uh, and then the ability to see your other uh, participants as well. And then the participation nudges. It's a little hard to see here, but the little uh, blue, blue, green, red over there to show people how much space uh, ultimately they've been taking up in that conversation. So that's the dialogue use case. Um, but I didn't use it so much for deliberations, and you did. Right, because we set something up called deliberations, and we had to do deliberations once we set it up to be called deliberations. Um, so <laughs> we wanted to take hard yes. political problems and try to create context where people could begin to deliberate on them in a productive way. And what we learned from this was the kinds of problems that deliberation would help. So one we launched in the most aggressive way was around the idea of uh, the Electoral College. And the way this was set up was to describe um, various modifications to the Electoral College, including doing nothing, um, and give people the chance to deliberate about them. And this structure um, asked people, you know, through all the things that um, Sam has just described, you get diversity and produce the right rooms. But people would begin by watching videos, which we had initially set up to be very high production videos um, that would, oh, you should be able to hear something here, but. You've got an important perspective. Yeah. What you think matters. And we want to hear about it. For the first time in American history, we're bringing thousands of people together virtually to discuss a fundamental question. How should we elect the president? Every election cycle. So, and they have pretty committed views about that solution. And the views they have are very highly partisan. So Republicans now love the Electoral College because it seems to be the only way that Republicans get elected. Um, and Democrats don't want the Electoral College because twice in the last 20 some years, we've seen the winner of the popular vote not actually win the presidency. So what's interesting about that is that we did surveys about people's attitudes before. So here's Democrats um, wanting to get rid of the Electoral College, have a national popular vote. Independents, a little bit less. Republicans, not at all. And deliberation didn't do much about this. The numbers are basically the same. So even though you, know, you give a chance to talk about it, and we didn't have the elegant sort of AI tools that might like get you out of your conspiracy theories. Um, but it didn't actually change stuff much. And I think the reason for that is that people kind of got it as they were in it, and they were just kind of reinforcing the views that they had. OK. The second solution we talked about is something most people don't know anything about, but it's the idea of allocating electoral votes proportionally by state. So if you got 40% of the vote as a candidate for president, you would get exactly 40% of the electoral vote. And the advantage to that is, like the national popular vote, there's a reason for candidates to care about every state. Because every additional vote you get gives you some fractional additional electoral college vote, as opposed to the current system where we know five or six states will choose the president of the United States. OK, so going into this, um, you know, Republicans still didn't like change much. This is the ex-ante polling. Um, Democrats kind of didn't understand it much, but they seemed to like any change to get away from the Electoral College. Independents were interestingly more interested in this. But deliberation here had a pretty dramatic effect on people's support for the idea, and interestingly, kind of a nonpartisan effect. Basically, a significant majority liked the reform after talking about it. And this is the kind of sweet spot, I think, for this kind of deliberation. 
something that you really do need 10 minutes to think through it, to actually get to a place that you understand it. And this is an environmental context that will give you that opportunity in a safe and constructive way. Um, and we did the same thing around ranked choice voting. Here was the before, here's the after. Similarly here, that's a complicated idea and it takes time to get it, but once you get it, there's a pretty universal support for the idea. So that began to target the idea that there are really important hard problems we face in a democracy that could uh, benefit from this particular architecture of engagement. And that was the model that got me into thinking how we could make this more generally available. That's so cool. I hadn't actually heard that part. Um, <laughs> that's a fantastic result. Uh, so yes, the point of this is Larry and I were very familiar with this platform already. We saw a lot of potential and it is a functional platform, right? It's already been used uh, for a lot of dialogue and deliberative events. Uh, and so when the opportunity came, we jumped at it. Uh, actually, it was before my time, so I can't take credit for that. Um, but uh, now we get to make it our own. Uh, so introducing Frankly. <laughs> That naming process, I will tell you, it was it was an endeavor. Uh, so yes, frankly.org uh, website is officially live as of yesterday. If you find any bugs, let me know. Uh, <laughs> so this is essentially our beta launch right now. So the state that we are in right now, the current status is in closed beta. So we have spent uh, a lot of time and effort uh, migrating over the existing platform from the team at Lightning Rod Labs, uh, working very closely with Ben and Danny. Thank you so much if you're watching online. Uh, migrating over their legacy platform over to Harvard's systems. Um, so core functionality is preserved. It is operational. Uh, we are limiting access to it uh, for the time being uh, for a variety of reasons. One um, being that it's not really our platform just yet. You know, we've migrated over a platform with a really cool foundation that we're excited about, uh, but we haven't, you know, we migrated over someone else's platform, right? Uh, and so we want to make sure that we have the time and energy to focus on making it what we want it to be next. So our, uh, our engineering priorities now get to shift to making it our own and bringing our vision to fruition. Uh, so it is definitely a, a work in progress still. So it is fully functional, um, but does not yet quite reflect uh, where we want to take it. Um, but yeah, we're excited about, about the potential. So if you are interested in using it in its beta form, or if you used uh, the, uh, the, the artist formerly known as Chasm uh, previously, uh, <laughs> then uh, feel free to reach out. We have links on, uh, on the website at frankly.org if you are interested in, uh, in access to the beta. Uh, and then where we are bringing it next. Right, so I, I think the most exciting part of this idea is not really the genius that a Harvard center will bring to the platform, though that will be genius, I guarantee it will be incredibly important how we evolve the platform. But what I think is the most important part of what we're doing is that we're taking the code that we are gonna be working on to build our better version of the old platform, and we are open sourcing it to everybody in the world. And we are inviting everybody in the world in the, in the um, development space to start thinking about how they can take the same functionality and fold it into either their own environments or how they can extend and make better the environment we're building. But we're trying to enlist as many creative minds on the problem of facilitating deliberation as we can. And we are doing it in a very traditional internet way by saying take it and build it and please just give credit. Um, and so that's a critical part of the deal. It took a lot for 
me to convince Harvard that we were going to spend a whole bunch of money on a platform and then just give it away for free. Um, but magically, we succeeded in doing that. Um, and, and my expectation is this will not just facilitate lots of people having cool new ideas about how to extend and make the platform better, but it will invite all sorts of experimentation on how does deliberation work better. So there are a lot of academics who have super cool ideas to test about how to architect environments of deliberation, networks to facilitate deliberation, who could, we hope, begin to use this as the testing space where they could be deploying their ideas and playing with their ideas so that uh, we begin to get um, really good information about what could work for the objectives we have. Um, one of my favorite recent books is a book called Change by Damon Santola. How many people have heard of this book? I love that book. Okay, it is maybe one of the top five books I've read in the last 20 years. So it is incredibly important in changing how you think about the world. But what's clear from that book is that problems are very different and the structure, the architecture of solving norm problems is very different from the problem of like just spreading information. And this, I hope, is a platform that begins to give us a way to encourage that kind of experimentation. Um, and so as important as it is that we have a cool new name, frankly, and we'll have really super new design, and we have an amazing team developing it, it's that the team is also inviting the world to build and develop it so that this becomes second nature to how people think about how you educate democratic society in the project of working projects, working on problems together. So if you're interested in updates, frankly.org, uh, there's a link to sign up for, uh, for updates there. If you have a community that would be interested in a platform like this, or even if you aren't interested in a platform like this, if you run or are involved in running deliberative or, uh, or discourse events, I very much want to hear from you. Uh, so there's a link for this on frankly.org as well. But if you are interested in, if you are involved in events and you want to be part of helping to shape our priorities for the Frankly platform, uh, there is a short link here, uh, brk.mn slash discourse dash survey. Um, and I would love to hear more about your events. All right. So um, this platform is an online video discourse platform, right? Uh, so as we went into this event uh, and started thinking through this discourse dump dumpster fires day, uh, we were trying to figure out how do we demo how do we demo this platform? Like the way you would demo this platform would be to get a laptop for each and every one of you and send you to separate rooms so that you can join this, uh, this event and we can send you to breakout rooms and show you how cool it is. Uh, and that doesn't really work. <laughs> um, so we're trying to figure out what, uh, what aspect of this platform we actually could demo. Uh, so one of our fabulous uh, software engineers here, Kathy, who's going to be, uh, I don't know if she's going to be super happy that I just called her out like that. Um, but uh, she had a, a great idea for something that we actually could demonstrate in person, um, which is the, the matching algorithm. Uh, so first off, I guess the link is already there, I should say, please don't do this if you're not planning to stay for the reception afterwards. <laughs> Um, or if you are online, so sorry. Uh, but yes, for in-person folks who are staying for the reception afterwards, uh, we wanted to have a way to demonstrate one of the really distinctive features of this, which is that matching algorithm. So we are doing a, uh, you know, a social, a networking reception after this, and I'm sure many, most of you have been to several networking receptions. And what people tend to do during those networking receptions is gravitate towards people that they already know. Uh, and so we uh, were thinking maybe we break that up a little bit. So 
certainly this is I think a two hour long reception what, what something around that uh, we do not expect you to stick to your uh, your prescribed groups during the entirety of the reception but think of this as an opportunity to at least meet meet and greet uh, some folks that you uh, that you maybe wouldn't have met otherwise so if you open this link uh, there are QR codes scattered under the um, under the chairs or you can use the one here or you can use this short link here fill out it's a super quick survey uh, it's just your name and a couple of um, of multiple choice uh, questions and don't press reveal yet leave your leave the tab open don't refresh um, but this is this is our MVP our proof of concept and I'm pretty sure it's actually gonna work we'll see if everything explodes it's possible but I, I think it's I think it's gonna work so this has to happen in real time. So for people who are in the room right now, if you are planning on participating in this, in this demo, please do this. Fill out some questions. I'm loving what I'm seeing. If you have trouble too, Kathy's, uh, coming around as tech support. So raise your hand if you're having any, any issues. I don't see any hands. Is the QR code not working? It worked for me earlier. OK. It worked? OK. I feel like we should be vamping. I don't know. What do you want to talk about? How's your day going? It's been a great day. <clears throat> it's been a really long, great day, but great day, though it's incredibly long. <laughs> Sam, I do think we have time for maybe a couple of questions, yeah. if anybody Trump. wants yeah. to ask any. Hi there, uh, my name is Connor. Thank you for this. Um, I have a question. So do you, as you were talking about scale, it occurred to me two things. One, who are the, who's the primary audience? Is it mostly community groups that have, are in your network and then want to take advantage of this? And then to follow up on that, do you find that just watching the process of deliberation shifts people's opinion? Because uh, I'm wondering if you can't have everyone participate in one of these, would simply like watching some content of this process on an issue that you aren't familiar with lead to a similar outcome? So uh, the answer to the second part is I hope not. Because I really hope that people have to be in the process of engaging to develop the intuitions that we need in a democratic environment. That's what I hope. But the experience might be different. We'll test it. Um, and who are the environments? Uh, I mean, who are the audiences? So one of the things that anybody who's done a deliberation platform knows is that the hardest thing is bringing people in. Like you imagine you're going to build it and they are going to come, but the field of dreams fallacy is a fallacy, right? And so part of the idea of open sourcing it was to say, Let's give to the people who know how to build communities the opportunity to bring their communities into this. So, you know, the open source version could, you could imagine like a uh, um, uh, 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 vanilla version that you can take and like set for your own website or your own community. You can imagine schools taking it and bringing it inside of schools. Like, let's have a conversation about you know, the Electoral College or something. Um, I don't know who's going to be able to do it best. Like we began talking to churches when we were doing deliberations.us and they were saying, let's mix churches from Baptist South with like churches in Washington state. And just imagine the deliberate, the conversations that could happen across those groups. And I think that if we just make it trivially easy for these experiments to happen and as costless as we can make it, as cheap as we can make it, um, we'll see lots of these things that surprise all of us. My product manager response to that question is uh, community leaders, whether that is uh, basically anyone who has an organization or a community where they would want to be hosting 
uh, constructive discourse events or deliberative events. So that would be folks who run uh, nonprofits or civic organizations, homeowners associations, uh, you know, all, all of all of that. Yeah. Democratic Party. That would be one. That'd be swell. Yeah, we'll get there. We'll get there. Uh, is anyone still working on submitting this? Has everyone submitted? If you haven't submitted and you still intend to, raise your hand. Great. All right. Kathy, do your thing. Um, so, some of the folks making this possible, I just want to make it abundant and clear this has been a, uh, a tremendous group effort. I know there's a ton of names on here, and I'm sure I'm forgetting a whole bunch, but so many people have worked incredibly hard uh, just in this first portion of getting the, the acquisition done. That was a heck of a... Uh, of a process before I even came on board, and then the process we've been working on since May within uh, within ASML to actually migrate this thing over. So thank you so, so, so much to everyone who has had a hand in this. Uh, I think we could take one more question maybe while, while Kathy's doing her thing. Oh, are we good? We got thumbs up? Okay. Oh. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you for creating uh, Frankly. It's actually very exciting and the, a lot of the features that you included um, are amazing. Um, I guess I, I have two questions. My first one was related to the first one um, and more specifically, I'm curious about your outreach strategies. So for example, if you aim to enable communities around the world uh, to use it, um, uh, how do you plan to reach uh, community leaders around the world uh, in order to encourage them to use the platform? And my second question um, is actually before when you showed the charts uh, that showed the difference of uh, the responses, um, I think that's very valuable. And I wonder if the platform itself has a feature to be able to fill out some uh, survey responses at the end so that you can measure the effectiveness of every deliberation. And then if you're doing that, then I wonder um, who would be collecting this data? Would it just be the person creating the deliberation uh, the deliberation, or would the would you be collecting all of that? And then, if you are collecting all of that, then I wonder whether that creates um, privacy concerns, especially if there are some private discussions. Yeah. Oh my God, so many questions there. Uh, one, I definitely want to speak to, uh, which is the the before and after. We actually did that for America Talks. I'm happy to talk to you more about it afterwards. But we used a metric called the Social Cohesion Impact Metric. So we had a pre and post survey, and we worked uh, with some very very cool researchers in order to do that and found that it actually had a, a very significant impact on effective polarization. So essentially toxic polarization uh, over the course of that like one hour event. Yeah, and I would say that you know, my objective is to make sure that this produces an archive of data that people can use to learn how to do this better. And to do that, you've got to solve the privacy problem up front. And it's not going to always be easy to solve the privacy problem because it requires trust in some contexts. Um, and some contexts, just you can't do it. So if we imagine K through 12 uh, schools using it and them running it on their own places, we're not going to be able to get access to much of that data. Um, but this is part of the pro uh, project to figure out how to build it so we can begin to produce for researchers as much data about what works and what doesn't work um, as we can. And again, to, f to fuel an ecology of thinking around this activity that includes coders and community leaders and educators and data scientists um, and eventually politicians um, to figure, figure out how to make democracy healthier in the way it actually operates. But that's a core part of the problem. Uh, we're going to get the hook soon, so I will be very, very brief in the other part of the question of the marketing strategy, and this very much relates to uh, the book Change by Damon Santola that Larry already mentioned. Uh, but this is not going to be a birdshot approach. We need to find the, the most effective nodes within the social network in order to leverage. Uh, so these are going to be who are the, who are the people that actively um, already know about this platform, have been using it, uh, who do Larry and I know the, the most, essentially, who are the, uh, who's going to be involved in that survey that's helping to shape it, like finding the nodes where people are the most excited about this and having them use it in their spheres and having it sort of spread from social node to social node instead of trying to get like as many people as possible to hear about this. Um, 
with that, everyone press reveal. And you should be shown a group number. Remember that number. Uh, once the reception starts, uh, this will be your fun, uh, your fun wayfinding mission. Uh, imagine people are going to want to grab grab some food and such. But once once you're settled a little bit, uh, find the members of your group, have a little chat. I hope you meet someone new that you wouldn't have otherwise uh, spoken to. And my our uh, our suggestion for your discussion prompt, obviously. You guys can talk about whatever the heck you want. But uh, our suggested discussion prompt to get you started uh, corresponds to the theme of the day, which is what is your favorite online civil space? Maybe one that's not such a dumpster fire. And why do you think it's not such a dumpster fire? And I just want to say um, first to Berkman and its presence, how incredibly grateful I am, Becca and Jonathan and uh, obviously the inspiration Charlie has always been, and Z is somewhere out there, um, for making this possible, for allowing this experiment, allowing me to participate in this experiment, and so grateful to the long list, but especially to Sam for bringing it to life. So thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you so much, Larry. I just want to end on maybe one very, very quick thought that has stuck with me from the panel this morning is actually Deb's uh, sharing of the idea of an intimacy gradient, which to me encapsulates so much of what we've been talking about today. The idea that there are gradients of discourse. It's not all one thing or another thing. And that there are so many dimensions. You've seen a few dimensions explored today. Pseudonymity relative to knowing who people are, and there's more than one way to do that large groups versus small groups, and there are different sizes. The idea of how much you assign people to groups, that you recruit people, that you give them structure, that you give them freedom. The ability to explore that entire human range of different ways to talk and work with each other is, I think, the path out of the discourse dumpster fires. Give people the chance to find the environment that works for them, to try different environments, to enter and exit different contexts with freedom, with choice, with the ability to be online and not have to start over every time as if they just entered this space for the first time. Um, speaking of that, another mode we're about to go into is an in-person reception. And for those of you online, I hope you will reach out and that, that community can build as well. Um, but thank you very much to all of our speakers, again, to the Berkman staff for putting this together. Uh, thank you very much and I'll see you at the reception. <laughs>